Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm sharing a recent q and I did for an amazing resource, resource I recently joined forces with, which is the Bump to Beyond online membership. If you remember from my recent vaginal health episode, which was number 135, a few months back I went to see a women's health physio in Sale, Manchester, which is local to me because of some issues I was having with my menstrual cup. I'd used it for years uh, with no problems. I absolutely loved it, recommended them to pretty much all of my clients if they got on with them, but I had an issue of removing it. The suction wasn't working and it was pulling on my internal organs, which wasn't good. So Deb helped me kind of understand what was going on. We couldn't find anything major that was causing it. She said sometimes things happen and change internally. And um, for now I'm avoiding the menstrual cup and I've gone back to organic tampons which I'm a little bit sad about I did love it but I mean my my vaginal health my structural health is important to me and who knows maybe I'll try it again in the future but my practitioner when I was there was with Deb Schofield the owner um, and the director of the company and we were going through the intake forms and everything and she asked me what I did so I said I was a women's health nutritionist and she was like oh my god she like looked at me and she was like I've been looking for a nutritionist myself for this amazing um, women's membership that I've been do- I've been working on um, along with some other experts I think there's a nurse in there physios and um, like breastfeeding experts and she'd been looking for a nutritionist to help with the nutrition side of things so tips on breastfeeding and getting the correct foods and nutrients in as a busy mum so it was definitely like a universe meant to be moment Um, I I think both of us agree with that. So I totally agreed. I said, I'm all for it. I I love supporting other practitioners in the industry and helping women in as many ways as I can. So yeah, we've joined forces now. I'm referring clients to her and vice versa. And I think it's important. And I'm glad that she's on the same page as well, that health is holistic and it, it isn't just physical and structural in the physio side of things. And it isn't just nutritional with what I do. It is a combination of everything. And I don't like it when practitioners just think it's all about the food or it's all about the exercise. It is a combination. And I've seen it many times with things like endometriosis or chronic pelvic pain. I can do the things in terms of anti-inflammatory and making sure that the estrogen and progesterone levels are optimal. But if they have um, severe tension or they have a prolapse or whatever, and then they're not going to get the full results. So it, it is a combined approach so I've agreed to be the expert nutritionist of that group and I'm doing regular Q&A's for them every three months or so online answering member questions so that's why I'm sharing a snippet of today it's the first one that I did um, about a week ago and I was asked questions surrounding nutrition for digestive issues busy mums and tips for dealing with morning sickness so in this book to beyond membership I'm going to include all of the links and everything if you're interested in the episode show notes, but there are other experts, like I said, physios in the group. They do online fitness classes. I've seen they do things like HIIT training or um, Pilates as well. And there's tons of education on there as well. I did a video on tips for Bump to Beyond. So all the women's health and nutrition advice that all women can benefit from. I made a video on that too, which you would get access to. And Deb said... The, the membership can pretty much benefit anyone with a vagina, but especially pregnant women, postpartum women and busy mums and struggling with issues like prolapse, pelvic pain, incontinence. So there's also wellness challenges and discounts on treatments if you are local to the Northwest. And the most important thing I think is the community aspect because this is very much lacking in some of the online spaces. And when you're trying to improve your health, the community aspect is really important and having a support system of a group of like-minded women, I really feel boosts your results that you get as well. So if you're interested in checking it out, Deb offers a two week free trial if you wanted to give it a try first. The links and details, as I said, will be in the show notes, but let's get into the interview that I did with Deb and I hope you enjoy it. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Schofield here, and I'm extremely excited to welcome Viv 
to our live Q and A for the month of October. So over to you, Viv. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little about you, your businesses, what you can offer our clientele, and then we'll get round to asking some questions to you. Absolutely. So my name is Vivian Allred. I'm a naturopathic nutritional therapist. So I studied at the College of Naturopathic Medicine, which is all across the UK. Um, and a naturopathic nutritionist doesn't just look at food and calories or anything like that. It's more about holistic health. So also looking at things like your digestion and your emotions and your environment, because they also play into how you're feeling. But I chose to specialize in hormone health and gut health because of my own experiences. I'm really not getting any anywhere with conventional medicine, really let down by the NHS, unfortunately, uh, as a lot of people are. I mean, it's amazing, but there's um, a time and a place for acute illnesses and injuries and everything like that. It does the best. And then when it comes to more lifestyle driven things or more of these chronic situations, um, hormonal issues in particular, women are often just dismissed. So I went to study after seeing the nutritionist myself and getting really good results but I now work with people struggling with all sorts of things, things like acne, skin issues, hormone issues, PMS, endometriosis, infertility, um, depression, anxiety, IBS, all sorts of things. And I absolutely love it because once you know some of this stuff, you just can't help but <laughs> say it to everyone. Um, so I'm very passionate about it. And yeah, my whole thing is getting the body healthy by giving it everything it needs to function optimally, removing the stresses and the blockages that can get in the way. And I believe that the body can heal from pretty much anything. I absolutely agree with you. And I think all the ladies in the membership are like really excited to kind of pick your brain today and ask you lots of questions. So I have collated a lot of the ladies that couldn't make it live, but Claire is with us this morning and did have a question for you. So over to you, Claire. Yeah, so mine's really around my hormones. I'm I'm getting into my mid forties, and I feel like I'm entering the perimenopause, but nothing confirmed, you know. And I don't know how you do confirm that, other than the symptoms and feeling. So sudden sort of gain of weight around my middle, which nothing's much has changed, but I've just put on a load of weight. So I was just wondering about eating around that and improving your hormone health around the stuff you should eat, avoid. Other, well, any any suggestions really on any improvements around that would be very welcome. Definitely. I think it's a huge issue as well. And a lot of people just think they have to suffer with it. They're like, yeah, this is just part of being a woman. You have to have this like terrible experience um, every day as a, like either, even as a mother, like being exhausted every day and then transitioning to menopause, like having these terrible symptoms that might be common in your family or in your friend circle, but they're absolutely not normal. In some cultures, they don't even have like a, a name for menopause because it's just a, a easy thing, an easy transition. I mean, there's going to be like some um, maybe a bit more fatigue and things like that, but it shouldn't be this like crazy time that you're dreading to happen. But perimenopause can be a 10, 15 year transition. So there's no real way to confirm it apart from maybe like lowering progesterone levels which happens um, as you start to kind of run out of your egg supply or the eggs themselves aren't as um, healthy and because of wear and tear from the environment over the years, they just start to degrade a little bit and therefore that's where uh, fertility levels start to decrease from age 35, 40 plus. Um, so you can still get pregnant up until you, your very last bleed, but it becomes less likely as you age, as most people know. But the main thing is that you're progesterone levels start to drop and that's the pro-pregnancy hormone and that's what makes us feel um, or should make us feel good leading up to our period whenever someone has terrible symptoms leading up to the period and um, it's more of this estrogen dominant situation so estrogen progesterone should be like this nice yin and yang and um, during the first half of the cycle it's natural and normal to be estrogen dominant but then as soon as you ovulate and we want to be ovulating whether we want kids or not ever um, so ovulation is more than getting pregnant we want it for health and it is an indicator of health as well but during the second half of the cycle once we've ovulated that's when we produce progesterone which kind of offsets all of the negative effects of estrogen so anytime someone has pms whether that's mood swings water retention bloating skin breakouts and um, spotting anything like that cramps it's usually that they have higher estrogen relative to progesterone this can happen when you're in your teenage years even or even in your 20s 30s but this is definitely happening when you're going through perimenopause as well so that's why you can experience kind of like pms on steroids 
during that time. Yeah. But it is always best to nip it in the bud and catch it as soon as you can. And you really can make a difference. But even I'm prepping, prepping for menopause and perimenopause now at 26 because it really um, is a knock-on effect of everything that you've done leading up to this moment. So the people with the worst perimenopause and menopause experience often had the worst health or lifestyles and things like that prior. Um, but there's not much you can do to kind of boost your progesterone during this time because it's a normal decline and that should happen. We can't prevent aging, but we can get rid of excess estrogen in the system. So you're not getting like ex um, excessive levels coming in and that's really skewing the, the balance between the estrogen and progesterone. Some people do take progesterone strengthening things or even take progesterone um, as like a bioidentical hormone to get them through. But usually it's as a, as a result of um, the estrogen either being too high or it's more of a bad type of estrogen. So it's going down the wrong pathways when it's being detoxified. Um, and long term, in some cases, that can lead to things like breast cancer. So it's not necessarily that estrogen's high, it's that it's an unhealthy type. And there's plenty that you can do when it's all the um, basic things a lot of the time, like maintaining a healthy body weight and not smoking, um, limiting alcohol. Um, even eating things like cruciferous vegetables, things like broccoli, particularly broccoli sprouts. You might not see them very often in the store, but you can actually make them yourself just sprouting the broccoli seed. They're extremely powerful at protecting against and the bad types of estrogen and therefore cancers. So I know that that's an extreme level, but all the same things that help with that help with um, the perimenopause or even PMS in younger individuals as well. So having one, one serving a day of some sort of cruciferous vegetables so like kale and cauliflower and brussels sprouts are in there as well so we're in like the right time of the year to be really up in all of those things um and lightly steam not raw raw isn't really good um you don't really get all the benefits from that and it kind of upsets the gut and the thyroid if you do so um and also when you go into full menopause which average age is around 51 i think currently so it can be like a good 10 15 year transition like i said once the ovaries kind of go into retirement and stop functioning, which is normal, it's the adrenal glands that are the backup reserves for that. The adrenal glands are the stress glands that sit on top of the kidneys. So this is why managing stress long-term and having a good healthy reserve, like enough gas in the tank, if you will, is really important because if you've depleted that, if you've been working night shifts and not been sleeping well and drinking too much caffeine, for years before your adrenal glands are already going to be stressed so that when you do go into full-blown menopause your adrenals are already depleted and it's just going to be a worse transition so i would focus on that um getting healthy healthier estrogen levels in the body through the cruciferous vegetables another one is one raw carrot a day which sounds weird but it really helps the estrogen and also your gut health like detox that too so that's an easy thing that everyone can add in but also the adrenal piece is absolutely key during that time and it comes back to removing stresses on the body, which is a broad term. Most people just think of like the external stress and work and emotions and relationships, which is important. But stress is also um, eating foods that you're sensitive to that is stressful to the body or having a deficiency in something like magnesium that stresses the body too. And again, that whole sleep thing, if you're not sleeping, your body's naturally going to be more stressed anyway. So um, yeah, getting back to basics, like seven to nine hours of good quality sleep a night, um, resting and slowing down as much as you can when your body tells you to, physical activity, but not too much. Some people go into like this intense workout when they start to gain weight and they start to cut their calories and start dieting. That is just going to make things um, 10 times worse. Oh, so yeah, just <laughs> keeping your body moving because there's obviously benefits to that, but exercise is a stress as well. So you don't want to push it too much. So yeah, very basic. There's not like magic supplement or anything like that with any of these questions really that I'm going to give an answer to. It's all getting back to these seemingly small habits. I know sometimes they can be difficult to do and you have to be consistent with them, but that's not just going to help your perimenopause and the full menopause journey, but also your future health as well. This needs to be sustainable. It can't just be something that you do for three months and then you just go back to how you were living before once you've started to see some results um yeah it's just these little things can really make a big difference even something like drinking enough water like two three liters a day can really help as well fab thank you so much for that okay so the next question is 
what is the best foods to eat or, or to avoid if you suffer from abdominal bloating? Mm -hmm. So the majority of the time, apart from the usual suspects like refined sugar and takeaways and junk food, it's usually not the food that's the issue. Because there's some people that are like, I'm eating the healthiest diet ever. I'm eating salads every day and home cooked meals and I'm still really bloated. In those situations, it's almost never the food that's the issue. It's just that the gut is impaired and it's just wrapped into everything and it's not digesting things properly. So I would recommend cutting out like the main triggers um, if possible. Um, some other ones that healthy uh, try, people trying to be healthy are still eating would be dairy products and also wheat products like gluten. They can still be big triggers. So I would recommend doing a kind of elimination diet, just cleaning up your diet in general. Things like fizzy drinks and alcohol and sugars can contribute as well. But if someone's already doing that, um, there are a subset of food compounds that can really trigger IBS and bloating and things like that. They're called FODMAPs. Some people go on a FODMAP diet for like the rest of their life and that's not healthy. It is recommended to be used short term, like up to about a month, six weeks maximum. So if you want some temporary relief whilst you're working on the root causes of your digestive issues, then maybe being mindful of some of these FODMAP foods could be helpful, but please don't just stick with that for the rest of time because it's just, it's like a band-aid. It is just managing symptoms. It's not actually fixing it, which is fine. But um, yeah, I'd want someone to have some symptom relief. And some of those can be like the healthiest foods ever, like um, onions and garlic and apples and um, cabbage and things like that. They could be FODMAPs. So just reducing, not completely cutting them out. And some people find that they're more reactive to one than another. Um, but root causes of chronic bloating is going to be some sort of um, digestive infection a lot of the time. Things like bacterial overgrowth and there's a common one called SIBO, which about 70% of people with IBS actually have as the cause of the IBS. So IBS is a symptom. Bloating is a symptom. It's not the disease itself. There's always something causing it. And if they get diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, why, why is the bowel ir irritated in the first place? It really is a wastebasket term so infections would be bacterial overgrowths sometimes um, yeast overgrowths can be common so if you particularly notice your bloating is worse with sugar um, then that could be a yeast overgrowth or maybe you're getting other fungal type symptoms like dandruff or athlete's foot or fungal nails um, maybe you get brain fog after drinking alcohol or eating sugar as well that could be a sign of a candida overgrowth um, or if you get thrush every month or have in the past um, and these can often go together as well. So it's not like you just have one or the other. You can have bacteria, yeast. That often happens because they're called frenemies. They like live together and they just make each other worse. But a big one I see is parasites, really. Um, I do a lot of work with parasite cleansing with my clients with all sorts of issues, even with things like infertility. Like I put someone on a parasite cleanse for a few months and they fall pregnant. I always say like, be careful if you're not wanting that because it can happen. <laughs> um, not that it's like the magic cure-all, but if you've got these parasites and you can get them from anywhere, but particularly certain foods like pork and fish, like raw fish, such as sushi. If you've had a history of foreign travel, particularly to third world countries, but I mean, you might not have ever left England and you could still have parasites because you might have never been to somewhere like Mexico or India, but the person preparing your food at the restaurant could have come back from last week and not washed their hands before making your salad and then you pick them up, unfortunately, through that. So parasites are huge. Um, so they could be um, big drivers of chronic bloating. So you would need to work with someone to go through a protocol to relieve them. Or it could just be that you have, um, that you're eating gluten or dairy and you're sensitive to it. Some people just, just remove that and the lifelong bloating goes away. Um, or it could just be that you have things like poor digestion overall because your body's too stressed. It takes a lot of energy and effort to make some of these digestive enzymes like stomach acid. I mean, the stomach acid should be like battery acid, a pH between one and two. And that takes a ton of energy and nutrients to actually make. So if your body's already depleted and compromised um, and it's only got a small amount of energy each day, it's not going to put it towards making stomach acid. It's going to put it towards keeping your vital organs functioning at like the minimum. So some people, it's just chronic stress or sometimes um, emotional trauma, things that's happened in someone's childhood can still be affecting the health in the current day because some of these emulsions can be trapped in the gut or in the um, pelvic area and there's um, things like the what they call the chakra systems 
I don't know if people have looked much into that, but a lot of people, for example, with thyroid issues often have a throat chakra issue, which is related to not speaking the truth or asking for what they need or using the voice. People with digestive issues and stomach upsets, it's often related to um, chronic worrying or not feeling safe. That's like the solar plexus. So if they've been moving around a lot as a child or if they're currently between jobs or hot homes or they've just finished with a long-term partner, then they might not feel safe in the world and that could trigger that as well. Some people with um, chronic pelvic issues, pelvic pain or fertility issues might have relationships um relationship stress with the mother that's a common one or they might have um relationship uh, issues around their sexuality or being okay with being sexual and things like that or have a history of abuse or rape in some situations so i'm very much um, interested in the food side of things but after working with clients for a few years i started to notice okay if someone's eating the most perfect diet in the world they're doing everything right what could be going on and that's when I started to look into like the real root causes of things, which are these chronic infections. Once you've got them, it's very difficult to get rid of unless you actually treat them. So the parasites, the bacteria, um, the emotional stress and trauma. I, I don't help people process that because I'm not an expert in that side of things, but I will educate them and move them on to someone else. Um, and then something like environmental toxicity um, can be a problem as well things like heavy metals in the environment these pollutants they can be a real root cause as well so there's only real like a handful of actual root causes to illness but then people develop all of these other labels and diagnosis as well they get diagnosed with a thyroid issue or autoimmune disease or IB, uh, chronic ibs or lifelong depression but they're still like the tip of the iceberg i want to always figure out what's going on underneath i know that yeah. was a bit of a tangent but no chronic, i mean it, chronic it, digestive it, issues <laughs> isn't just for like cut out more food and eat more vegetables and fiber and drink more water that's like the standard advice sometimes that works which is great but if people are chronically suffering it's not normal you shouldn't have to live with it i once went to a gastroenterologist because i was having severe bloating before i knew about any of this and he just told me everyone gets bloated after eat eating it's normal and i said i never used to like six months ago so that's not true <laughs> but it's, it's just I mean, crazy isn't it Go on, if Claire. you have an infection what what kind of things do you do about or if you feel like you might you know when you were talking about the yeast and mm -hmm. all the bloating around that and the cleansing diets what what does that involve yeah sometimes i do um test to make sure and just if the client wants to test and just see on paper this is the problem this is what i've been struggling with for how many years that's fine so the stool testing that picks up and um, things like bacterial overgrowth and stomach acid and your immune system and everything like that for the yeast and the fungal aspect there's a urine test called an organic acid test that's a bit more specific to yeast and candida it's known as so that's why i pick for that but honestly um some of these tests can be a bit, bit pricey so like two three hundred pounds so a lot of the time with my clients i can just get an idea as to what's going on based on um, experience and the symptoms and the health history so i would just um, assume that they have it and get started with some treatment and it usually involves some sort of herbal antibiotic so it's different than a conventional antibiotic that just goes in and kills everything good and bad these are derived from herbs and plants which are a bit more specific they they've kind of worked with us for the big since the beginning of time so they know what works in our bodies what the natural environment is inside what's good and what's bad so they're more specific to the bad stuff but um yeah herbs like garlic and oregano and neem um, can be really effective against all of those things but there are some ones that are very specific against yeast versus parasites but sometimes just getting them started on a few weeks of that and if they feel better then that's a sign that they're on the right track um, but sometimes they can actually feel worse temporarily because as these things die off in the body they start to get um it's called a detox reaction or herxheimer reaction so if i put someone online to, like a parasite protocol and they feel absolutely terrible um it's usually that they have a lot of parasites and it's a huge problem they just need to go slower they need to help the liver out a little bit um because yeah they can feel worse before they get better that's like the healing journey fab okay me lovely next question so the next question was about perimenopause so i think we've we've gone through that so we'll move on to the next one which is what can i help to um what can i eat to help gird and hiatus hernia 
it's kind of a similar thing so good yep. is um gastroesophageal reflux yeah um so any like heartburn or you feel like you're regurgitating your food afterwards or there's like a sour taste in your mouth the whole time some people get it lower down in the chest like heartburn or just discomfort and they just pop the rennies or drink the gaviscon and think that's normal as well but it's not and most people think that that's due to high stomach acid levels but it's very much the opposite. 95% of the time, it's low stomach acid levels that causes that feeling. I know it feels like it's acid coming up, but actually what happens is when you eat your food, there should be this nice strong acid there to kind of burn it immediately, cleave off the nutrients and send it through the rest of the gut very quickly. Whereas when you have low stomach acid levels, the food just sits in the stomach. And that's why people can feel like they've, when they have something like a steak, for example, they it just feels like it's a rock in their stomach for the next three hours so the food sits there um, and it because there's no stomach acid so it starts to putrefy and ferment and rot in the stomach that causes a lot of gas and it's that gas that you can feel coming up um it's like a, a vapor uh, a vapor coming back up through the the gut um so it, it feels like acid but it's, it's very much due to low stomach acid levels so if you take something to suppress your stomach acid even more like gaviscon or Rennie's, or something like omeprazole in more extreme cases, and um, that should be a very short-term recommend, a uh, very short-term medication. But there's people on it for decades, and that's um, very much linked to things like Alzheimer's and dementia down the line. And even that's coming out in the conventional um, research now. So you want to, um, as much as you can, strengthen the stomach acid. Root causes to that could be an, a bacterial infection called H. pylori that lives in the stomach. Some doctors do test for it through a stool test, but the testing isn't 100% accurate. So even if you've been told that you don't have it, some of these more um, fancier tests that I do um, can pick it up. Or it could just be that you do some basic treatment for it. And if you feel better, then that's a sign that you have it because this bacteria is like a corkscrew shape and it's very um, sneaky the way that it works. It's, it burrows its way deep into the stomach lining. And that causes a lot of things like gastritis, ulcers, in the gut and this uh, reflux situation so even if it's not showing up on tests um it's almost always um present and yeah there are some herbs out there like mastic gum or matula tea that can help but i would recommend working with someone um because in some cases they don't have h pylori or you've treated it and it's gone but they still have that feeling so then it's time to rebuild the stomach acid levels and you can work to think work towards things like actually taking hcl hydrochloric acid as a supplement but you really want to be sure that you don't have h pylori or gastritis or ulcers before you do that because it's just adding acid on top of a wound in the stomach um but then if you want to um, start with something at home it could be like apple cider vinegar before meals like a, a teaspoon up to a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in a small amount of water 10 minutes before food that helps to boost your stomach acid a little bit it's not to the level of the hydrochloric acid pills but again if you feel relief with that then that's a sign that your stomach acid's low but i would recommend again um to avoid these elimination diets too extreme because loads of things can be triggers for reflux so there's the usual suspects people know about alcohol and spicy foods and chocolate can be one with reflux but you should be able to tolerate those things um, it's not again the food that's the problem it's your gut that's the issue so you might want to limit them short term um, but then adding them back in once you fixed the actual problem, which is usually some sort of infection or low stomach acid situation, which can be driven by stress. Again, it all comes back to stress. Um, there are some foods that can help soothe it um, and some natural alternatives to these anti-inflammatories, um, things like DGL licorice um, or aloe vera juice or slippery elm tea can just help to soothe it. But again, they're it's kind of band-aids but I understand that some people just need some relief to like sleep or function in the work day. Yeah. So one of our um, lovely clients, Rosie, she is, was really healthy prior to having a baby. And um, I know it is really difficult because you, when you do have this baby and obviously our, a lot of our clients, it's finding that time to, make those quick easy meals when you're knackered and stuff all the time so Rosie ends up kind of just doing she's vegetarian so 
corn nuggets and oven chips or going to McDonald's. So she wanted some kind of quick, easy veggie meals for the whole family when she can just make when she's knackered and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I personally don't um, recommend vegetarian diets. I understand there's like um, ethical reasons and that's totally fine. But if she's doing it, trying to be healthy, then that's not usually the best idea. Um, I really believe that um, animal protein along with the veg vegetables is the ideal human diet, especially for women in this depleted state. So anytime there's like um, fertility issues or someone's struggling with health issues or the yeah, postpartum or whatever, you need this animal food to kind of build you up because it's the most um, easily digested, which is um, sometimes we're told the opposite, but it's true animal protein as opposed to things like lentils and beans is very easy to digest and the nutrients in there are more bioavailable. So yes, spinach might have some calcium or um, zinc in there, but from a piece of beef is gonna be way more absorbed um, into the system. So yeah, I'm not um, massively experienced with making vegetarian meal plans or anything like that. So I'm usually just like meat to veg type of person. And I feel like that works totally well and it's so much easier, but um, the basics of building a plate for anyone is you want three components on there so she can just take this idea and then just find the there's different rotations that you can have of that at breakfast lunch and dinner every meal that you eat should have some sort of protein so the vegetarian sources of protein are going to be eggs um dairy products if that's tolerated like the high quality ideally organic with dairy and um, the um, lentils and beans and legumes side of things and then um, soy products I'm not a huge fan of tofu corn isn't really a food at all in my opinion it's just made in a lab and Mo Farah probably most likely does not eat that to fuel his his marathons um, so that's a bit of marketing for you so the only soy product that I would recommend is tempeh which is fermented soy as opposed to just pure tofu because that one can um, really affect the thyroid gland long term and the postpartum period anyway, and even during the perimenopausal shift, your thyroid is very susceptible to go out of whack. That's why things like postpartum depression and fatigue um, can happen in her loss during those times. It's because the thyroid gland gets stressed out and can't keep up. So if you're eating a ton of tofu and soy milk and soy yogurts as well, then you're just making it even worse. So tempeh is fermented. So all of those negative effects are pretty much gone because it's the way it's been processed. Um, and then, yeah, with lentils and beans and things, ideally, we want someone with healthy digestion, because if you eat a ton of them for anyone, it can cause some gas. So if this person's also got IBS, then that's why I'm saying it can be really difficult to eat um, and meet your needs, because you're getting a ton of fiber at the same time, and it can just make your bloating even worse. So if she has some sort of protein in her meal. I mean, you can even just swap regular pasta made with wheat gluten and things like that for lentil pasta chickpea pasta and then you can put some cheese on top of that and like a tomato sauce and then you've got way more protein than you would be having with just a regular um, gluten pasta um, because of the lentils and all of that so every meal you want some sort of protein with someone who eats animal foods then that's going to be your meat fish egg uh, seafood all of that you want some sort of healthy fat um, so obviously in meals like eggs, you've already got the healthy fat within the eggs. So you don't really need to add a ton more, but if you're having like a, a lean chicken breast or your lentil pasta or whatever, you want to add some healthy fats to that. So they're going to be things like olives or olive oil, coconut products. So you can have coconut milk or yogurt or oil, um, nuts and seeds can be within that as well. Um, butter or dairy products, if they're good quality, can be your healthy fats, maybe some dark chocolate. It doesn't have to be in the meal, but alongside the meal, maybe after just a couple of squares of dark chocolate um, to finish off the meal as well. And then your carbohydrates, you want them to be um, very easy to digest, complex carbohydrates. So I always say like roots, root vegetables, parsnips, beetroots, carrots, squash, a nice time of year again for them, potatoes, sweet potato or regular, and then fruit. Um, so any type of fruit can be fine as well. Um, things like honey and maple syrup can be nice, healthy, easy to digest carbohydrates too. Um, or things like if you can tolerate them, rice and quinoa, buckwheat uh, as well. But I, I do recommend a gluten-free diet for most people, honestly, regardless of what you're dealing with or if you just want to stay healthy long term, because um, a lot of people have a sensitivity to it and it doesn't have to come out in digestive ways. You might not have diarrhea every time you have some pasta. 
but it can manifest as fatigue or skin issues or mood swings or sleep issues. Um, it, it affects the gut in everyone. It causes this thing called leaky gut, just gut inflammation. Um, and they've even done studies and found that everyone after eating gluten has this leaky gut response afterwards. Uh, but particularly if you have a diagnosis of IBS or bowel disease or thyroid issues or autoimmune disease, things like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, celiac disease, definitely that's like a gluten, very serious gluten intolerance then you want to be gluten-free just to help manage your condition long-term. So if every meal you pick from those groups, and this person can Google um, vegetarian protein options, vegetarian healthy fats, and then the carbohydrates are going to be vegetarian anyway, and then just mix and match at each meal, make sure you have some sort of component. It doesn't have to be this gourmet meal um, and perfectly go together every time. I mean, sometimes it looks like a toddler has made my lunch because it's just like grab a handful of chicken, grab some like lettuce leaves and like just mix things together and then have like a bit of a handful of nuts afterwards. And it doesn't matter. Like ideally you want a nice meal every now and again, but sometimes you have to think of what your body needs, not what you're craving all the time. Yeah. Um, so last two questions, my lovely. When eating healthy, I struggle to maintain the weight on. I want to keep the weight on, but also eat well. So any tips of kind of gaining a bit of kind of keeping your muscle mass up, but keeping the weight on situation? Yeah, I would also um, tell this person, so there are some things that you can do. And if she's not eating enough calories, because um, that can be hard, that can be difficult to do if you're eating a lot of vegetables and salads, yeah. they're very low calorie foods in general. So some people find that when they swap from a regular, like unhealthy diet to a healthy diet, they're eating just as much, if not more than they usually do, but it's very low calorie food. So our bodies, although calories aren't everything when it comes to weight, they are still important. You need like on average, a woman is like 2000 calories a day. So she's only getting 1400. Then that's, that's part of the reason. So increasing calorie rich foods, it's going to be your fats mainly when it comes to healthy foods, uh, cause they per gram contain about eight calories, whereas um, protein and carbohydrates is about four calories per gram so all of your fats that i just mentioned coconut products so you can make a smoothie in the morning i mean my smoothie every day contains at least like six seven hundred calories so it's got things like nut butter in there and nuts and seeds and coconut milk um so you can really pack in a ton there you can have like an extra avocado for lunch um and you can have like a little dark chocolate bar after your dinner so i personally can't relate because i could just eat like so much food in a day, but yeah, just start with that. Track your calories with something like on the app Chronometer or My Fitness Pal, and just see how many calories you're eating um, is first. But if she's really struggling, she's eating enough and she's still losing weight or finds it hard to keep weight on, it's um, usually as a result of something else, either like a thyroid issue, hyperthyroid, overactive thyroid. Your metabolism is just too fast, and you're just burning through your food um, too quickly or often it's the stomach um, and the digestion issue as well. If you have parasites, they're gonna be leaching the food from you. As soon as you eat, they're gonna to get to it first and then they leave you either excessively hungry afterwards. So people who are constantly hungry or seeking sugar and food, it's often that they have um, some sort of infection um, stealing their nutrients. And people know like if they've been to again, Mexico and they've got a parasite, they can often lose a lot of weight and muscle short term. So it not, might not be a very acute, um, big infection, but a chronic smaller infection. They can just over time waste away the body. Um, and yeah, things like um, poor digestion in general, if they're malabsorbing their food, they could be eating all of this healthy fat, but it could just be going straight through to the other end. If things like the bile and the gallbladder and the liver aren't processing the fat, the gallbladder produces bile, which is like this very liquid that emulsifies the fat that you eat into these little bubbles so that you can absorb them into the system. So many women have gallbladder issues that can often lead to them actually getting them removed. Um, they get like these severe gallbladder attacks or stones and then they're just like, oh, you don't need that organ anyway, just whip it out. But you need the gallbladder for so many things. Bile is important to digest your fats. Like I said, so if you have your gallbladder removed, you're gonna be chronically at risk of um, fat, um, fat deficiency and you need healthy fats to build hormones. Um, to build skin cells to function your brain um, you need it to absorb certain fat soluble nutrients like vitamin d a e and k bile is also a detox um liquid as well so bile 
contains all of these toxins like estrogen once it's been used you want to get that out um, and also pollutants in the air and heavy metals and things like that waste products from parasites and bacteria is stored in the bile and then removed through the bowels in your stool so if you have um, gallbladder issues then that's not happening so you um yeah you might be eating enough fat and food but it all comes down to uh, are you absorbing it this is the whole thing you are what you eat so i always say you are what you absorb Fab, thank you my lovely so the last question i'm presuming it came from a pregnant lady but i'm i'm not so sure because i think it came through um um my receptionist emily that just popped it in so i'm not sure but the question is it will make sense is there anything i can do nutrition wise to help ease my sickness so hence i think okay. it's probably a pregnant lady yeah but even in general um yeah. same things kind of apply and other certain supplements that are off limits um during that time some digestive enzymes are safe to use during pregnancy but definitely if you're not um just to help you digest your food whilst you're eating it because if you're not digesting it breaking it down properly and it's stuck in the stomach like I was saying with the reflux issue, then you are going to feel um, uncomfortable and nauseous and things like that. Um, there's a big thing with bile as well. If your bile and your gallbladder isn't flowing, you can feel nauseous. Um, so looking into that as a factor, some of the best foods and nutrients for the gallbladder is um, choline. And that comes from egg yolks. I know a bit controversial, but I'm a whole, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about my kind of philosophy, around pregnancy nutrition and it's just kind of the same thing for any woman anyway and um, there's a really good book and podcast by lily nichols and um, her thing is real food for pregnancy i interviewed her on my podcast which is hormones in harmony a while ago it's, it's right back at the start um, if you search lily nichols hormones in harmony you should find it she talks about how um these ancestral foods like organ meats offal and egg yolks um and bone broth are some of the best foods ever for pregnancy you have to be mindful not to overdo the liver but no one's going to get to the point with it overdoing liver it's quite impossible to eat so much that your body becomes toxic because of the whole vitamin a um, controversy but even with that the um, vitamin a that they used in the study is synthetic and they did it on rats and then it gave them kind of um issues with the fetus development um but whole food vitamin a from things like butter and egg yolks and um, beef liver or chicken livers or whatever is totally safe and it's actually important for pregnancy so yeah there's the whole book and um, series on that if you want to look into it but um eating the the nutrient like choline which is found in egg yolks and um, organ meats like offal helps to support the gallbladder so that can help with the nausea it could be a gallbladder issue the whole time eating little and often. It's not usually what I recommend. I'm usually like three square meals a day type of person to give your gut time to rest and digest. But in this situation, eating little and often, so not having these huge meals, just grazing kind of throughout the day usually helps. Um, propping yourself up when you're going to bed so that you're, um, you're not getting this kind of nauseous feeling as well. Sometimes ginger can help. Start with ginger tea and ginger in your food. And then you might wanna work with the practitioner to consider ginger capsules. Sometimes a vitamin B6 deficiency can contribute to morning sickness and nausea as well. So ideally someone should be taking some sort of B complex at minimum or some sort of prenatal, um, but there's an active form of B6, which is called, um, uh, what is it, pyridoxine? Yeah, pyridoxine biphosphate. So want to make sure that you're getting that version. That's like the active B6 version. It, it usually comes in a lesser dose than the regular ones because I'm not a huge fan of the regular prenatals and things like that um so they would be my top tips you might want to try um spacing your fluids away from your meals if you can because sometimes drinking a ton of fluids around meal times can affect your digestion and your stomach acid I'm going to try a little shot of apple cider vinegar before each meal like I was saying before in a small amount of water and just mindfully eating your meals this is for everyone chewing your food thoroughly slowing down, not eating when you're stressed, giving yourself time to sit there and digest the food instead of running off to the next task. Anyone could benefit from that. That's absolutely amazing. So we can't thank you enough for my, your brain. Oh my God, your brain is <laughs> massive. <laughs> you know so much. Now I know like you've got a lot of free resources. You've mentioned your podcast. There's loads of other podcasts. So if any of my clientele wants to work with you or access any of this of other amazing resources, how do they kind of get in contact with you? 
Yeah, so my podcast, Hormones in Harmony, is on um, iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube even. If you search um, Viva Natural Health on there, you can find all the videos if you want to watch rather than listen. My website is vivanaturalhealth.co.uk. On the, if you're interested in working together, um, you can have a little bit more of a read through how I work and my approach. And then if you feel like it would be a good fit on your end, then you can sign up for a free 20-minute enrollment call. And that would just give us a chance to chat a little bit further, find out if I can help you. Um, so I don't take out everyone as a client. I want to make sure that um, you're definitely getting the best help that you, you need. Um, so you can set up a call there. There's a free download section on that website as well with like tons of guides that go from everything from sleep to um, balancing your blood sugar to um, cleaning up your home from these environmental toxins. So they're all free to download as well. On social media, um, my handle is at Viva Natural Health. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And yeah, I think that's everything. You can send me a message if you want to learn more. Thank you so much, my lovely. You're welcome. Thank you.